But can I give you a little bit of encouragement if you're feeling a little bit disoriented right now? Anytime I feel disoriented, God desires to reorient me. And remember, every time God starts removing old wineskins, he's ushering us into a new season, but it's not just that he's bringing us into a new season. With the new season comes new wine. What if everything God does is actually designed to produce more intimacy? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Leader's Cut. Can I tell you how much I love you? Like, legit. I know we haven't met and we're doing this whole thing like from afar, but we're really not far because the God of the universe is closing the gap between me and you. And it is clear he is in this space, this place, this time. Uh, as I was just praying uh, <laughs> before we started filming this episode, uh, it happened again. This is two in a row. I just sense the spirit of God sweep in in like the sweetest but most sovereignly powerful way. And I just started singing a new song to the Lord. I mean, just a sweet new song. It's like all I felt I could do. So I don't know what's about to go down in this episode, but my Lord and my God, when he sweeps in like that, I am here for it. And clearly, one of the reasons he's sweeping in like that is to pull up a seat at the table, not just with me, but with you. He wants to sit with you. He wants to invade your whole life by invading this next hour in a way that it's beyond anything you've experienced before. And that is part of my prayer. Not just that you would learn something during our time, but that you would encounter the capital S, someone. <laughs> I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> You just got to let me be a little boy. Let's pray. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I think on paper, a lot of us think is like some, uh, you know, terrible and confusing thing. And while it might seem that, I actually think what we're talking about today is a good thing. All right. We're going to talk about the curveballs of life. And some of us might be in the midst of a few curveballs and you are pissed about it. So let's pray, and I believe by the end of this episode, if you're ticked about the curveballs you feel like God's intentionally throwing at you, I believe by the end of this episode, and trust and believe, if you're navigating curveballs right now, you must make it to the end of this episode, because I, as I was studying and praying through this episode, um, homie started throwing heaters at the end, so just get to the end uh, into our prayer time, all right? Let's pray right now and ask the Spirit of God to do work in us, spirit of the living God. They are not here for, for me. <laughs> they are here for you. They are not tuning in to listen to me. They want my best friend. And I have no best friend better than you, more bester than you. God, I pray right now that wherever they are, and whatever they're doing, I pray for an invasion of your presence. Would you please do for them where they are what you just did for me where I am? I pray for an invasion. Holy Spirit, some of us are going through some curveballs that we did not expect. And the enemy would love to use that curveball to brush us back and cause us to fall. But God, during our time together today, may we see that the sovereign one is behind all of the pitches. And he's turning it all for our good and his. Holy Spirit, would you take the sweet but sharp knife of heaven and cut upon our flesh to make more room for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry my face is a little puffy because I've been crying before we even hit this, but let's jump into this. Who cares what I look like anyways? All right. All right. The question we really need to talk about with this episode is, can you and I handle the curveballs of life? Because here's the reality. Life in a fallen world is going to be filled with curveballs we don't see coming. It, it is a guaranteed part of life. And I want to give you four questions that as we answer them, I believe they will help you navigate the unexpected things in life. But more than anything, I think that if you allow the Holy Spirit to do a little bit of cutting and moving things around in your heart, I, I believe you're going to start looking at curveballs as one of your favorite pitches to see. Now, so that we're on the same page, uh, uh, I, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, you might call it the unexpected. You might call it a uh, difficult transition. Uh, you, you know, I don't know what you would call it. I'm using a baseball term, a curveball. Uh, hitters in baseball, Major League Baseball. Uh, lots of great hitters can sit on the fastball because it just comes straight at them, right? And they can just sit on it. It doesn't move. It's just fast. And they can just sit on it and hit bombs. The curveball, though, starts up here and ends down here. And so if you're swinging, based on where you see it, when you start the swing, you will always miss the curveball. And many a great hitter of the fastball is unceremoniously removed from Major League Baseball because they can't hit the curve. I believe this is a picture for humanity, and this is a picture for every Christ follower. Every follower of Jesus Christ, every child of God, every person who has dwelt within by the Holy Spirit needs to know how to hit life's curveballs. So let's jump into the questions. And question number one, if you don't understand what a curveball is, we'll get on the same page, all right? Question number one, what is a curveball? Preston, what, what even is a curveball? Like, what are we even talking about? Here's how I would kind of describe it. A curveball is a mini season between two big seasons. It's a life transition you don't see coming that you kind of see as difficult. All right, so it's not just a transition, it's a hard transition. But I think the best way to see a curveball isn't just it's some difficult thing. It's really more of a difficult transition. Let me try and paint this picture with Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, many of us know this passage of scripture starting in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. That's how I memorized it. He will make straight your paths. Have you ever noticed how we take a verse like this, and we just assume that what it means is all of, all of life's paths will be straight as long as we acknowledge God in all things. And so we, we just see the will of God as though it were some linear line. Let me tell you one of the things I have learned in 45 years in a fallen world. There is no such thing as a linear line in the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? There's no straight line in the kingdom. And, and you are setting yourself up for disappointment if you expect when you walk with God, every line to be straight. This is why I kind of call it a curveball, because it, it's like when it seems the path will stay straight, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the path takes a sharp right turn near the edge of a cliff. <laughs> you just don't see it coming and it's like, it feels like a crash. Curveballs almost feel like crashes, but they're not. They're just really sharp turns. God is in. Now, just so we are on the same page and, and uh, I know who I'm speaking to, let me give you three kind of um, 
symptoms of a curveball. You know, what, what does it look like to be experiencing a sharp right turn, a, a uh, unexpected and difficult transition? What, what does it feel like? Preston, how do I know I'm in one? Well, uh, three things. First, a curveball is disorienting. Here's the definition of the word disorient. To cause someone to lose their sense of direction. You're walking straight. You feel like you understand how everything's going to go. And then, and here's what happens. That one sharp turn. Imagine you're in a car. Okay. This is probably the best way to illustrate it. You're in a car going 85 miles an hour down a straight away and you're just hauling, picking up speed. Now you're at 105. You're just flying. And then you see a cliff and you, you try not to crash and you make this hard turn. You actually make the turn. You don't go off the cliff. What would happen to everything in the vehicle? It's going to go flying, right? Not, not just one or two things, everything. When you are going that fast and you make that sharp of a turn, everything in the vehicle your life is going to feel like it's being uprooted. It's flying in the vehicle. It's disorienting. Another way to say it, it's a curveball is when a season goes from predictable to unpredictable. But can I give you a little bit of encouragement if you're feeling a little bit disoriented right now? Anytime I feel disoriented, God desires to reorient me. Every time I feel disoriented, I, I don't feel, I, I know the, the sense of direction that I once did. God is reorienting me. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says, for God is not a God of confusion. That's what disorient feels like. It's confusing. Down seems like up. Up seems like down. Left seems like right. Right seems like left. Disorienting is confusing. Now remember this verse. Whenever you feel disoriented, our God is not a God of confusion. He's not the author of confusion. When you feel confused directionally, it's not because God is changing things up. It's because your enemy is trying to mess things up. So the first thing we feel when we are in a, a curveball type season in life, we feel disoriented. It, it, it just, nothing seems like, like I quite, like I used, if I went like this, it, it worked like this, but now it seems like if I go like this, it works like that. It, I just feel disoriented and confused. That's how you know you're swinging at a curveball. The second symptom of a curveball is disappointing. Curveballs are disappointing. They bring disappointment. Disappointment always comes when things don't go the way you hoped. And we're going to deal with that in this episode with, with expectations and hope because uh, typically, our response to the curveballs that God navigates us through and desires we go through, uh, typically, when our response is negative, like disappointment, and it's okay to be disappointed, uh, it's actually healthy to be disappointed, not to live in disappointment, but it's a healthy thing to experience disappointment because it can be a reorienting moment. Let me say it like this. Man's disappointment can lead to God's new appointment. <laughs> but we experience disappointment when we navigate an undesirable or undesired surprise. Here's one of the things I've learned about me when I begin to experience disappointment. Anytime I feel disappointment set in on me heavily, it's typically because I've forgotten some things I should never forget. 
maybe you're not like this, but I, I am. When I get disappointed, usually it's because I get so focused on one thing that I wanted to go one way, which didn't go that way. It went the opposite way I wanted it to go. And, and I feel just an overwhelming disappointment, which then starts to try and permeate my whole life. Have you ever felt like that before? Where you were disappointed in one area and then it got so heavy, it started to become invasive. And before, you weren't disappointed in your marriage at all, but all of a sudden, now you feel like you're disappointed in your marriage too. You weren't disappointed in your children, now you're disappointed in them. You weren't disappointed at your job, now you're disappointed in your workplace. When one thing we fixate on, so much so, and when it doesn't go the way we desired, and disappointment sets in on us, disappointment can start to invade other parts of our lives. For me, this typically happens when I forget things that should never be forgotten. Let me show you. Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. A great way to pray during disappointment, seasons of disappointment. Watch the next line. And forget. Now, now, this is David talking to himself. And you better not forget all his benefits. And then he goes on to list the benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When I'm disappointed, every time one of the reasons is I have forgotten something he never wanted me to forget. Now, if you're experiencing disappointment presently, let's, let's just talk for a moment, all right? Because I'm not trying to move you on to dust yourself off, stop being disappointed and forget not all his benefits. I'm not saying that. I'm telling you it would help. If you, in, in your disappointment, would do your best not to forget all the benefits that come with being a child of God. Having said that, though, crushed expectations, which oftentimes that's what leads to disappointment, is when our expectations or our hope is crushed. Crushed expectations need real room. For real time grief. You need to make some space for you to grieve. Somebody told me earlier this week, I just talking about some things I'm grieving. And they said, Preston, you can understand the measure with which you love or loved based upon in part the measure with which you grieve. Grief is not a bad thing. Grief is a healthy thing. And sometimes I think as believers, we think the godly thing to do is just dust ourselves off, get back up. I'm a child. Like, I, I get all that. But I, I also have to make real room for real time grief in my disappointment. You want to know why? Because I've learned if when you're disappointed, even if your disappointment is in God, even when you're disappointed, if you don't make room for grief, here's what will happen. You will end up resenting God. A lack of grief in the midst of disappointment will lead to a lot of resentment even towards God. So if you're experiencing disappointment right now, let it out. I know one of you is already crying. Good on you. It's okay to be disappointed. It's okay. It's okay to be allowing yourself to grieve what you lost, which you never thought you would lose. Listen, it's just you, me, and the God of the universe. Whoever took it away from you, whoever left you, and therefore disappointed you, 
They're not in this discussion right now. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not coming at you. And most certainly the God of the universe isn't. Go ahead and let it out. It's okay. Grieve. Because if you don't, you hold on to it. Grief in part is the act of letting go the hurt that comes from disappointment. Letting God into it. And every time I've made real room for real grief, I feel the God of the universe come in and just put his hands on my heart. And he usually says several things. One of the things he says is, Preston, I am here. I know this hurts, but I am here. One of the other things I feel him say when, when he comes in and just puts his hands on my hurting heart, I've heard him say this several times. Aren't you excited for the day when this will no longer exist? Rest in the day where there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. Child, that day is coming. And in your pain, make space for the truth that it will not always be like this. But for now, it is. And no, even in your pain, I am present. I am very present in the midst of all of your pain. Make some space for grief, all right? It's a safe place to do it in the presence of the Lord. Here's the third kind of symptom, so to speak, of a curveball, the evidence of a curve curveball. I'll use the word disorderly. It's just disorderly. It, it feels like a season of disorder, a lack of order. Let me give you a couple of definitions for the word orderly. Orderly means having a systematic arrangement. Neat. Marked by or adhering to a system or method. Another way to say that is predictable. Devoid of violence or disruption. Peaceful. Okay. If that's what order or orderly means, then disorder or disorderly means the opposite of all of that. A season of disruption. That's a curveball. A season where it feels like there's no system or method to advance. That's a curveball. A season where nothing is neat. That's what happens in the turn of the curveball. This next one-liner might hurt for some of us to hear. Because some of us, instead of using the word disorder, we might use the word chaos. Well, present the way I would describe a curveball is it's just chaotic. Everything is chaotic. And here's what I'd just sweetly kind of submit to you. Disordered feels like chaos when you're addicted to control. Disorder actually isn't chaos. But for some, it feels like chaos. For those who are addicted to control, disorder will always feel like chaos. Let me give you a different way to see disorder. Here's the picture I felt like the Lord gave me. Disorder is where God reorders things when things get disorganized. Another way to say disorganized, when things get organized in a way which will not produce the outcome he desires. When God reorders things, it is for my and your good. But here's when we get ticked at God. When, when we feel like we would rather things be disorderly, but stay that way because then it's predictable. 
But when God reorders or reorganizes, it's completely unsettling because it, it's all unknown. Disorder is not chaos. When things get shaken up and God is in the middle of the shakeup, here's how we need to see it. It's a season of reorganization. Anybody ever heard the term spring cleaning? Anybody ever, you know, you're in a busy season and kind of the messes in your home start piling up and maybe the Christmas trees stay up a little bit too long. Everything's just a little disorderly. And then you take a weekend and just spend the whole weekend as a family reorganizing everything. Doesn't it feel awesome on the other side of the reorg? Yet many of us look at seasons of reorganization and call it a curse. Yet when we get to the other side of the cleanup, quote unquote, we always feel better. We always have that oh, so much better. And yet in the middle of the cleanup, we are all frustrated and, and just can't wait for it all to be over. Curveball seasons are typically disorderly seasons. Things are getting shaken up. All right. One of the things that might get a little disorderly is our feelings. Curveball seasons typically expose our true feelings. Calm seas typically don't expose our deepest feelings, our truest feelings. But curveballs and stormy seas almost always expose our true feelings. And then something else that typically comes out of us in, these, in the disorder as a part of that which needs to be reordered. Questions arise. This is what we need to be really, really careful for. Watch out for if we're experiencing disappointment in the midst of disorder. We need to be really careful with the questions we raise. Questions like this. Does God even care? Is God even real? Listen, when our hope is in such a specific outcome that we attach God's realness to the outcome, we have fallen away a bit. All right? So just be careful in the midst of your frustration with the disorder as God reorders and reorganize, just be careful how much of your feelings and emotions you let fly, all right? Trust that the work God began in you, he will work unto completion. And you will get to that point. If you will just follow him and give him everything he asks for and obey, you will get to the side. <sighs> so much better. Question number two, where do curveballs come from? Another way to say this one is, so why does God throw curveballs at us? All right. Now remember, God's never trying to hit you with a pitch. It might seem like that, but remember, curveballs start at the head and they end up at the feet. All right. So it may look like it's coming for your head, but a curveball that's thrown by the Lord never hits you in the head, never actually hits you. Okay. It, it, it drops, all right? It has more than one direction and more than one purpose. And I want to show you, I believe, three of the purposes God has for the curveballs of life, all right? Here's the first one. God's desire for growth. God navigates us, causes our paths to go through the curveballs of life because he has a desire for our growth. Have you ever seen these uh, machines that um, it, it, it's like like an ab machine I've seen uh, where they, they like put paddles on their abs and then turn the machine on and it, it like sends shock to stimulate the muscles thousands of times, thousands and thousands of times in a 30 minute period. And they say it, it'll burn some fat, but even more so grow muscles in your abs. Okay. I, I've, I mean, it works. I've, I've seen people 
that use it. And I've, I've often been intrigued by this, but here's what we have to remember as it relates to our spiritual growth. All right. Let me say this in kind of a sarcastic way. God has no time for sexy muscle. God wants functional muscle. God's not looking for a measure of spiritual muscle that looks good in the pew, but weak in the streets. Holla at your boy. God wants functional muscle. I learned this principle, uh, and some of you may totally push against what I'm about to say. It's okay. Uh, when I started doing some hot yoga, I'm not talking about chanting and all that stuff. For me, uh, hot yoga is healthy stretching. All right. I'm not, I'm not chanting. I'm not repeating anything. I'm just in an extremely hot sauna like room, stretching my muscles. And I will tell you from experience that my back, I went from having incredible back pain and stiffness to nada. All right. So I don't need to throw that in there, but here's what I learned as I was going through hot yoga, uh, with my sister-in-law, I was lifting weights and my body was looking better, but my body was still hurting and it was still unable to function the way I needed it to function. Then I started doing hot yoga and a, an amazing thing happened. I didn't necessarily see like my body change. So I, I, I didn't look better in a, a bathing suit kind of, of health or strength. I was functionally stronger than I had ever been in my life. And I wasn't putting up heavy weights. I was actually just lifting differently. This, I believe, is what God is after as it relates to our spiritual growth. The hypocrite wants the sexy spiritual muscle that looks really good in the pew. But the God of the universe, with all of my heart, I believe, wants the spiritual muscle that is effective on the earth, not pretty in the pew. Here's what growth looks like. Remember the story of Job? Job, you talk about a curveball. You, you want to read a hard curveball? Read the first couple of chapters of Job. My man went through one of life's worst curveballs and God was in it. Now the enemy was behind it, but God was in it. And you might need to, to be reminded of that so that you don't start resenting God. Because when I say God throws the curveball, another way to say it, and probably a better way, is there are times the enemy throws the curveball, quote unquote, but God is in the curve. All right? That was Job. So God didn't throw this pitch at Job. The enemy did, but God was in it. And God was doing something supernatural through it, to which we're still talking about it today. But in the midst of Job losing all of his possessions, his homes, his family, everything, everything. He had a few friends and a wife. He pretty much lost everything else. Listen to what he says. The, this, this is a perspective of growth, spiritual growth. Job 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job is literally saying, even though it feels like God is the one taking all of this away from me, I'm still going to trust him. What I feel and what I see will not move me off the wall. Now, did he battle through disappointment and pain? Of course he did. There's nearly 40 chapters of it. But did he stop trusting in God? No. This is a part of what healthy spiritual growth looks like. Being able to navigate the storms of life, the unexpected storms of life, and not give up on God. Not change the way you see God for the worse. Though he slay me. Yet will I trust him. Preston's paraphrase, even though I didn't want to go through this, even though I didn't want God to be in this because I didn't want anything to do with this, I will not stop trusting God. I will not change how I see God for the negative. 
even if God is doing this to me, I still trust him because he's doing something I can't see. I think one of the big reasons why God allows curveballs is because if we let them, curveballs grow us spiritually. Come on, be honest. In, in calm waters where your ship is in the harbor, let's be honest. We really don't grow all that much when things are easy. The church doesn't. Study church history. The church is always at its best in trials and tribulation, when she's persecuted, when she's pushed on. If we will let God he will use the curveballs of life to grow us healthier and stronger, which are both necessary for what he's going to ask you to do in the days to come. Don't curse the curve. The curve always is designed to help grow you. Second thing uh, behind the curveballs of life, I think is God's desire for intimacy. I actually think God lets us experience curveballs, those sharp turns for intimacy. Let me ask this question. What if everything God does is actually designed to produce more intimacy? What if we actually saw everything God does through that lens? (laughs) I think it would change how negative we all get. If everything God does whether it seems good or bad, easy or hard. What if our lens was, you know what? Everything God does is designed to produce more intimacy between me and him. How would that change our lives? Here's verse, Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower or fortress. The godly run to him, the Lord, and are safe. You've got to see this picture, okay? I'll put it on me. You personalize it for you. It's like I'm in the middle of the curve and things are flying every, everywhere. Down is up, up is down. And I just cry out to the Lord, why does it have to go like this? And God says, Preston, every time I put you in a situation where you don't know how it's going to go, you always come even closer to me. The righteous run to him and are safe. What was the point of a strong tower in biblical days? It was a place of protection. Why would you need a place of protection when you felt threatened? When you felt under threat, you would run to the tower, to the high ground. Here's the picture. Have you ever seen like in a movie, uh, a, a young man and a young woman at a movie. Maybe it's a date. Maybe this is a TV show. They're on a date. They're watching a scary movie and she jumps. You know, it's like the quintessential, and probably the guy jumps more than the girl, but ladies, you know what I'm talking about. It's just that quintessential picture in, in a TV show. And she, she gets startled and, and she leans in on the one she's sitting next to and he kind of just real cool puts his arm around her. Get the picture. Get that same picture with the Lord. That when I encounter something that scares me, when I encounter something that's highly unexpected, here's the picture. The Lord says, Preston, the righteous, here's what they do every time. Those situations cause them to run to me, to push in even closer to me. Preston, I want you to know something. I desire to be so close to you that I will use anything and everything to make it come to pass. I want you near and near and near and near to me. And I will use anything to bring you closer. If that's part of his design for the curveballs of my life, why would I ever curse the curve? How about this passage, this verse, Isaiah 41, verse 10. God says, fear not, Preston, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, 
Don't be overwhelmed, Preston. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I. Preston, when you're scared, when you're uptight in the curve, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When I read this verse, I felt the Lord remind me of a moment that I hold in my heart as a picture, a memory, when my only daughter, uh, Riley, was like three years old. She broke her arm and they had to do some things to get it set the right way. And it was extremely painful and it was scary to, of course, to a three-year-old. And Holly and I, uh, her mother and I were there and here's what we did as her broken arm was being pushed on, moved around, being caused to experience pain. What were we doing? We were holding her by the hand. Baby, look at me. It's okay, honey. I know it hurts. Hold my hand. Squeeze my hand. Honey, squeeze it hard. Just, you can hurt my hand. It's okay. You're not going to hurt me. Do whatever makes you feel better, baby. Just hold my hand. Can you even wrap your mind around the God of the universe saying to you, I know you're scared. But every time you go through situations like this, seasons like this, don't ever forget, Preston. Here's what I'm doing with my hand. I am holding you by the hand and I am upholding you with my hand. The hand which holds the universe up right now is the hand which holds me up in the curve, in the storm. Crazy to think about that one of the reasons that God allows us to go through the curves of life is to bring us closer to him. Do you know how intimate that is? That's like the sweetest thing ever. And he's not playing some game. He's pursuing our hearts. And I think we all need to do a little bit of a better job saying, you know what, Lord? When I hear, when my heart hears you say, come away with me, come closer to me. My prayer needs to be, Lord, not only am I coming, but by any means necessary, draw me closer to you. <laughs> you talk about a dangerous prayer. By any means necessary, bring me closer to you. Hey, do something I've never asked you to do, just so we can see. We, we are a, a little family here. If, if that's your heart, God, by any means necessary, bring me closer to you. Put that in the comments. Put that in the comments. Put a little prayer unto the Lord that we can all grow from, learn from in the comments. I'm not doing it just so there'd be more comments. Hey, we're family. Talk back to me. What would life look like if we daily prayed that prayer by any means necessary? God, bring me closer to you. And this next one is going to get me a little bit riled up because the pictures I felt the Lord give me, I don't know why it seems like he's given more pictures uh, in this season, but man, the, these pictures be coming and coming and coming. And I got all riled up when he started pushing this button. Here's the third thing I want to show you that I believe is behind God allowing the curves in our lives. I think it's God's desire for enforcing victory. I think one of the reasons we experience the curveballs of life is God's desire to enforce victory. Now, remember, victory has already been won. Can I get an amen? Jesus has already defeated death, hell, and the grave. 
Victory has been established. But I believe one of God's favorite things is for victory to be enforced. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. <laughs> Look, I have given you, speaking to his disciples, not just the 12 or the 70, you and me. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. That's a great reminder for those of us who feel like in the middle of the curveball, we're being picked on like Job by the enemy. Preston, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Snakes and scorpions, type and shadow, a type, a biblical type of demons. Preston, I've given you power over all the enemy. Another way to say it, Preston, I won the victory. And from a place of victory having all power in heaven and on earth. I'm giving you the authority over all his power. Now remember, God has all power in heaven and on earth. So I don't have the power. The power is on loan to me because he has, has all the power. But he gives us the authority over all the power of our enemy. Here's the picture I felt like God gave me because I kind of asked this question. Sorry, this chair makes me kind of sink down. I got to gotta get back up, bad posture. You know what I'm saying? Here's the picture I kind of got um, when, when we're going through the curve. It's like me saying to God, why, why does it have to go like this? Like if you're turning it for my and our, his, good, why, why does it have to go like this? Why, why am I experiencing this in between, this mini season in between two big seasons? Here's what I felt like the Lord says in response. Preston, it's because I love making my enemy relive the 72nd hour. Get it now. You're not ready for this. Here's the picture. Satan doesn't know the end from the beginning. Don't ever give him credit as though he does. God, only God knows the end from the beginning. So Satan thinks Every curveball in our lives is where things take a turn in his direction. Satan actually thinks our transitions are his trophies. But this is what that is like. It's like an opponent cheering before time runs out. This is exactly what Satan did after the crucifixion. God gave his enemy 72 hours of curve to think the crucifixion brought him victory. And in the 72nd hour, he got up. And the enemy, the devil saw those three days were not the victory. It just looked like you had won. But when he got up that day, that beautiful resurrection morning, Jesus sent the message. You have been defeated. Check and mate. Think about this. Is it possible one of God's favorite things is to force Satan in arrogance, divine arrogance, perfect, perfect power and confidence. Okay. Not demonic pride, but is it possible that God forces his enemy to relive the 72nd hour every time he allows us to go through a difficult curve season. And when he turns it for our good and his, God's good, it's like the 72nd hour all over again. Right now, some of you are in the middle of the three days. And the enemy is taunting you, trying to make you feel like Satan has won. Listen to me closely. Not only has death been defeated, but the devil has been defeated and our God reigns. And so if you are in the middle right now of what felt like a crucifixion, death and the resurrection where God redeems it and turns it for your good, you need to remember it's highly possible one of God's favorite things 
to do with his enemy is to make him relive that 72nd hour and shove it in his enemy's face. face. You have been defeated. Can I just tell you I love it when he talks like that? <laughs> and but he goes even further. It's not just that he likes to reinforce the victory. Okay. I want you to get an even clearer picture of what that looks like. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. But thank God, God has made us his captives, speaking of believers, and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Okay, here's the picture Paul is describing as he writes this, um, a Roman triumph. Here's how it would play out. If a general was responsible for killing more than 5,000 enemies, Rome would have a triumphal procession. And here's how it would go. It, it, we would kind of call it a ticker tape parade. And the general would be at the head of the parade, all right? Because they had just defeated at least 5,000 enemies and, and killed them. So Rome throws this big party, this big profession. It's going through the streets. Everyone is cheering because now they feel safer. This is what Paul is describing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That through Christ, Christ is our victory. And Christ is the head of the procession. God leads us in the triumphal procession. Jesus is the head. He's the one who won the victory. Here's what was awesome in Rome with a general's child in the midst of a triumphal procession. The child of the general who defeated at least 5,000 enemies got to walk behind their father's chariot. I want you to wrap your mind around this. That in a triumphal procession, Jesus leads it. And his co-heirs, the children of God, are next in line. I am second. How about that? I am second in the triumphal procession as God's child. God is leading us in victory, allowing us to share in victory. All that comes with victory. That's where believers are today. Right now, we are in the midst of a triumphal procession. Death has been defeated, and so has the devil. I think this is why God allows us to go through and leads us through curveballs. Because it's in the curve where the enemy thinks he's won. It's the period of in-between. And isn't God so amazing? That he loves rubbing victory in our enemy's face so much so that he would take us through the 71, 72 hours of curve just so we can enforce the victory of the 72nd hour. <laughs> Question number three. How are curveballs good for us? They are good for us, all right? And I could give you an exhaustive list, but we've already... Spend enough time together. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to keep you forever, but I do want to give you a couple of things, all right? Uh, because most certainly, you will not learn to enjoy the curve if you resent the curve. And you will resent the curve if you think there is no good in the curve. But curveballs are actually good for us. Here's the first reason curveballs are good for us. They're designed to keep us humble. Curveballs keep us humble. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. The Lord will give me this reminder every once in a while when the, I'm in a straightaway season and I start possibly kind of feeling my oats a little bit and, and I start thinking, oh yeah, this is how this is going to go and this is how this is going to go. The Lord will let me go through a curve and he will bring to my remembrance, James chapter 4, 
verses 13 through 16, which say, look here, Preston, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we will stay there for a year. We will do business there and we will make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? God says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, Preston, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants me to, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Verse 16, otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, Preston, and all such boasting is evil. (laughs) Sometimes I hate this, and, and I really hated it when I was struggling enormously with pride back in the day. And, and I think we all, from time to time, battle a little bit of pride it, because it, it's a spirit. It's not just a behavior. Pride is a spirit that tries to get us to walk in pride. So it's always going to be trying to knock on the door in a fallen world with imperfect humans. And so we, we, we need to be aware that pride is, there's always potential for pride, especially in the seasons of the straightaway. Sometimes God takes us into a curve just to humble us and remind us, Preston, you don't know the end from the beginning. And pride will hurt you far more than going through this unpredictable curve will. And so I'm going to lead you through that curve. I'm going to be present in that curve. You know, one of the things I have learned going through a couple of seemingly violent curves. I've learned I'm not that great of a driver. You know what I'm saying? It's the straightaway where we think, oh, I'm an amazing driver. I'm a great leader of this organization. I'm a great owner of this business. I'm a great parent. Then we get into the curve. And what happens? We're moving so fast. If we were actually steering the vehicle, we would crash. This is why the ark didn't have a steering wheel. I don't believe life as a Christ follower is meant to be lived with a steering wheel. Only pride wants to steer. Humility always says, Jesus, take the wheel. (laughs) And curves are one of the ways that God keeps us humble. I can't tell you how many times I've been guilty of of a a little bit of cockiness in the straightaway. And then when I see how violent that curve is, and it's a 180 degree turn and I'm moving at a speed and he won't slow the vehicle down. He won't slow, slow my life down. It reminds me, oh, that's right. My life was bought at the highest price ever. And I'm not actually in control of my life. Jesus. Would you steer me through this curve? I don't want to crash my family. I don't want to crash the organization. I don't want to crash the team. I don't want to crash the ministry. I don't want to crash the relationship. In humility and health, that's when we say, Lord, you steer. I'll go wherever you go. Like Ruth and Naomi, where you go, I'm going. So you just steer. I'm a passenger, not the pilot. Here's another reason. Another, uh, I think, reason. Curveballs are good for us. They keep us alert. Curveballs are designed to keep us alert, to keep us on our toes. One of my... um, and I want to be gentle with this, bigger frustrations with the capital C church, but just with all of us as believers, it appears as though sometimes we have a tendency to be lulled or dulled. Um, when the church, the body of Christ was meant to be a cruise missile spiritually, sometimes it just seems like the church becomes a cruise ship where everybody just wants to be chilling and, and not advancing and, and, doing this and doing that and and laying out. And I'm not, you know what I'm saying. I'm not anti-rest. 
But too much rest is never a good thing. And if I am, am chilling too much, I'm actually not on alert when Jesus actually commanded us to be alert. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 34. Jesus says, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Kind of imagine that's what's going on on the decks of the cruise ship. Preston, don't let that day when he returns catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. So keep alert at all times. The church, the bride, every believer is commanded by Jesus to keep alert at all times. When I was flying um, and learning how to fly, one of the things that kind of caught me by surprise when becoming a pilot was autopilot. Like I actually hadn't thought that the plane I would fly uh, on an entry level uh, in general aviation would have autopilot. That I could set the course, flip a switch, and turn around in the back of the plane or have my iPad out and be working on stuff. Like I, I actually thought the only way that I'm going to be able to fly this plane is manually. I didn't think there was going to be autopilot. And the plane actually had it. You know what's funny? Not once have I ever used autopilot. Here's why. For me, personally. Now, I, I know some great pilots. My brothers are phenomenal pilots. My dad's a phenomenal pilot. They use autopilot. Okay, But for me, as a learner and a new pilot, a new time pilot, low time pilot, I felt it was unsafe to ever let go of the wheel. Another way to say it is to not be alert. Like I know we just literally talked about letting go of the wheel. Now I'm giving you a little bit of a different picture. I'm using it to show alertness, okay? Not control, but paying attention, alertness. Because what can happen when we put things on autopilot is we stop paying attention to things which matter. The fastest way for a crash is to be distracted when we should be focused. I think it's entirely possible to say that some of the crashes, quote unquote, that the church has gone through throughout church history is when she was lulled to sleep. She wasn't on alert. Have you ever uh, seen a movie with somebody who has seen the movie like 10 times? but it was your first time. How do you both watch the movie? If they've seen the movie 10 to 15 times and you're seeing it for the first time, most likely you're going to pay more attention to the movie because you have no idea how it's going to go. But the person who's watched the movie 10 to 15 times has seen the movie so much that they know exactly how it's going to go that if they get a text, they're not afraid to fire it off. You you're, you're totally captivated by the movie. Obviously, we're not talking about Hallmark movies, lady. Just playing. Just playing. But those are pretty predictable. You're sitting through the movie totally captivated. And you're getting texts. You're not even paying attention to your phone. Why? Because you're wanting to know how this goes. And so you stay on alert. You stay focused and at attention. But the person who thinks they know how it's going to go puts it on autopilot and stops paying attention to things they probably shouldn't be missing. Let me use, though, an even clearer picture in Scripture for what I think um, God does with the curveballs, the, the good that's in the curveball. Curveballs are designed to bring in new seasons. The curve brings us to a new road. The way scripture uh, might talk about this a little bit is like, like this. Here's how I'll say it. Curveballs bring new seasons. And new seasons bring new wine. But God will never put new wine in an old wine skin. 
Luke chapter 5, verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. So the wine and the wineskins will be lost when new wine goes, goes into an old wineskin. And look what happens. And the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wine skins. Here's how I see the curve. I see the curve as God removing the old wineskins. And it hurts a little bit because you don't see it coming. It's like, well, I like that wineskin. He's going, no, no, no. And remember, every time God starts removing old wineskins, he's ushering us into a new season. But it's not just that he's bringing us into a new season. With the new season comes new wine. And he's putting the new wine in that new wineskin. Of course, the curve is a good thing. The curve is where God swaps out the old wineskin in preparation for the new wine. Here's the question you're going to have to answer. Would you rather have yesterday's predictable wine or tomorrow's unknown, untasted, unseen, indescribable wine. I think some of us idolize the predictable. When we do, we're always going to miss out on the next new great wine. That brings us to the last question and an important one. How do we dominate the curve? That's kind of the language in baseball. How do we dominate the curve? couple of things. First, kill your expectations. If you've run with me for any amount of time, you've heard me talk about this. Second Kings chapter five, go read it. In my opinion, one of the uh, greatest passages in the Bible uh, on expectations. Uh, Naaman is sick. He expects that he'll be healed a certain way. It doesn't go the way he expects. And because he idolized his expectations, he almost gave up his healing. This is what we do. We don't just want what we want. We want it to go the way we want. And when it doesn't go the way we want, we can, because we worship how we want it to go so much, we, we can almost be guilty of giving up on what we wanted. Because we're so addicted to it going our way, exactly the way we want it to go. Here's what you got to remember. Expectations are the root of every heartache. Expectations are the root of every heartache. Expectations are one of man's favorite idols to worship, in my opinion. I expect it to go this way. I, if I just do this, this, and this, I expect it to go. Do you know how much heartache I've seen? Because people expect things God never desires. Well, Preston, God, God will give me the, the He's going to give me the desires of my heart. Uh, Cupcake, don't be taking scripture out of context. I'm being sweet and silly when I say that. When my heart and my desires are aligned with His, He will give me my heart's desires because they're actually His. <laughs> he's not saying, Preston, whatever you desire in your heart, I'll give it to you. No, no, no. That's not how God talks. So don't expect him to and never expect it to go that way. One of the best ways to dominate in the curve is to make sure in every straightaway, you never idolize expectations. You never create an expectation so specifically clear because when we do, how are we ever going to experience Ephesians 3? The God for whom nothing is impossible, he, exceedingly abundantly, above all we could ever ask for or imagine. That's our God, okay? Help me understand how your expectations for God to do something a very specific way. Well, if I just do this, this, and this, and I wait, God will give me the perfect husband. First, perfect husband doesn't exist. Second, I promise you that's not how it's going to go. It, it, 
rarely, if ever, goes the way you expect it to go because he is the God of Ephesians 3. Exceedingly abundantly above all you ask for or imagine, expected. Okay. You want to dominate the curve? You got to kill your expectations. Expectations set you up for disappointment. I'm not telling you to lower your expectations. I'm telling you to kill them. Lowering your expectations is a temporary thing. Killing your expectations? And here's my expectation. God, I have no idea how my life is going to go. And I, I would be arrogantly foolish to presuppose that a fallen man in an imperfect world, a fallen world, is, is literally going to know the end from the beginning? I most certainly do not. I do not have all wisdom, and I don't know the end from the beginning. So why would I walk around acting like I do? Expectations are dangerous, all right? You want to dominate that curve? Kill the expectations. Next, you want to dominate the curve? Properly place your hope. One of the shakiest ways to live is with a hope in a specific outcome. So not just to expect a specific outcome, but to put your hope in that specific outcome. Man's hopes revolve around what an outcome will provide for us. Whereas God's will revolves around what the outcome will produce in us. <laughs> I love it when he talks like that. My hope? My hope isn't in the outcome. Listen, if, if my hope was in the outcome of some big church that everybody that helped raise me would be proud of me because it hit a certain number, you know how disappointed I would be? Do you know what my hope is? My hope is that he is present. My hope is in him. Outside of that, I have no idea how this rodeo is going to go. This rodeo called my life. But I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm going to fight not to put my hope in the outcome. I'm going to put my hope in the God who's overcome all. Psalm 42 verse 11 says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I, if, here's the inference. Here's how I'll overcome my discouragement and my sadness. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again. In other words, I kind of stopped for a brief moment because I was discouraged and sad. We're human. I'll put my hope in God. And that will cause me to praise him again, my Savior and my God. Discouraged? Sad? Maybe it's because your hope was in something other than God. Your hope was in an outcome. I've said it hopefully enough in this episode. One of the fastest ways or paths to disappointment is putting your hope in an outcome. Outcomes will never bring what God can and will bring. So my hope is in him, not in it or to them. My hope is in him, capital H. Here's the last way to dominate in the curveballs of life. And for those of you who made it to this part, this is where we just pin our shoulders back and remind ourselves and our enemies who our God is. You want to dominate in the curve? Remember his sovereignty. Remember the sovereignty of God having all power in heaven and on earth in such a way that he is in absolute control. Our God will never know what it's like to be out of control. Now we read Romans 8 verse 28. And we, believers, children of God, know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. The curveballs of your life are not a surprise to God. Romans 8 says that not only are they not a surprise to God, but that God takes even the curveballs of your life and actually works them to your advantage and his. God is so in control that his hobby is taking what Satan means to harm you 
exert his control, and spend even the bad and difficult things for your good. Talk about rubbing it in your enemy's face. Even when the devil comes and tries to rip Job's life apart, God says, watch this. I'll work this together for his good and for mine, and I will rub it in my enemy's face. Listen to me. There are going to be many curveballs in life. Don't allow anxiety to get you focused on feeling out of control. Allow peace to reign in your heart and in your mind because we have a God who is in total control and will never know what it's like to be out of control. This car ain't crashing when God is the one steering it. Even if something leads to the point of death, and I know in a human world, we think that's like the worst outcome. How can death be the worst outcome if when I open my eyes, I am in the presence of the one I have been chasing for the bulk of my life? Our God reigns, and we must never forget that, especially in the curveballs of life, in the crazy curves we didn't see coming. I want to pray over you. Uh, over all of us, uh, but especially those of us who are in the middle of the curve. All right. So let's pray as we wrap our, uh, up our time together. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having all power in heaven and on earth. And God, while we get a little bit confident in the straightaway seasons, we're reminded in the curves that you are seated on the throne and no one will ever be able to push you off of it. You reign in the heavens and on the earth. You are in control. You are the sovereign one. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being present in the curve, for being control in control in the curve. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who before this episode felt like they were about to crash in the curve, spirit of the living God, would you come upon them in such a way and remind them so clearly, you are the God who reigns and is in control. And this car is not going to crash. There is a testimony on the other side of this trial. And we overcome our enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. God, thank you for being with us and allowing us to be with you. Teach us to navigate the curves of life in such a way that we allow them to produce everything in us, that you are able to then do everything through us, which you have established for us to do. So God, we say, Thank you for the curves by any means necessary. Use them to bring us closer to you. Love you so much. You are amazing. You are a savage. I love spending time with you. I'm praying for you. And if you're in the curve, don't grab the wheel. Move in closer. To the one you love. I love you so, 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 so much. And I'll see you next week.